Here we are at the Earthship in Brighton. The Earthship project in Brighton has been going for probably about three and a half, four years, and this is the stage that we've got to now. The Earthship is a totally self-sufficient off-grid building, and what I mean by that is the fact that the building has no connection to any main utility whatsoever, whether that be gas, water, electricity. It harvests all of its resources from the world around it. It's called an Earthship because just like a ship sails on the sea, it's a vessel that has everything on board to sustain life. The Earthship does, except it sails on the Earth, so this building provides everything that you would need to have habitation, that you would need to be comfortable, and that you would need to survive. What we've got here is an optimal skylight, and a very, very simple gravity-fed system, so it's just got a counterbalance that just opens. The whole ventilation system in the Earthship is quite a simple concept. It's just got ventilation at the highest point, which lets all the hot air out, and then it's got operable windows at the lowest point, out in the sun space and behind you as well, in the hut. And you just literally open those and they let cool air in at ground level. And the skylights let out all the hot air at ceiling level, so it creates a little vacuum, draws through all the hot air, and just gets rid of the heat very, very quickly. The airship is built from lots of different materials, probably the most unusual material are used car tyres. In this country we throw away probably about 48 million a year, that was the last statistics for a couple of years ago. And we get those car tyres and we fill them full of earth and we ram them full of uh, earth or chalk as we have in this instance. And that's what we build the basic wall structure from. So you end up with very, very thick, dense walls. And the idea of those walls is a very simple principle. The sun's energy enters through the whole sort of south face of the building, which is glass, and the energy flows through into the space and it's absorbed by the big thick walls that are made from car tyres. If you looked at the actual walls themselves, you wouldn't know that they're made from tyres because they're rendered over with mud and cement and other things, so when you look at them to all intents and purposes, it's just a finished wall. There are lots of other different materials in the building as well. We've tried to use as many different reclaimed materials as we can. For example, the salvaged uh, stone granite blocks behind you and all of the reclaimed timber and other bits and pieces. And you can also see these walls that have been made from bottles that have been cut up and put together. It's quite an interesting technique. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea with this approach to building is the fact that it's very, very light in the way that it uses resources. And, and what I mean by that is the fact that it uses no fossil fuel whatsoever for its day-to-day -day running that be space heating or heating hot water or, or so on and so forth. And the absolutely critical thing about this is in the majority of our buildings, we use fossil fuel to provide power for them. And every time we use fossil fuel, carbon dioxide emissions are released. And that in itself isn't such a bad thing until we start to look at the sheer scale of the amount of buildings that we have. And then we start to really see the huge volume of CO2 that we release as a nation, as in the UK, or globally in a year. And if we look again at the amount of carbon dioxide that's attributable to our homes, it's about 29% of the UK's total carbon footprint. So what I mean by that is the fact that every year, about a third of all of the carbon dioxide emissions that we release as a nation come specifically from our homes, specifically heating our homes and the power that we use in our homes, but, and heating hot water as well. And, and that's the crucial thing. And if we look at the overall picture of how much carbon dioxide has been released in the last probably 100, 150 years, we can see that it's increasing at a rate of knots and slowly and not so slowly in some instances we can see that the climate change that is directly attributable to all of the carbon dioxide that we as a species have released is having a profound effect on the rest of the ecosystem and it's slowly, slowly destroying it and changing weather patterns. Probably the most significant idea in the Earthship is the idea of passive solar design and that's quite a sort of long sort of technical phrase but really all it means is the fact that the building actually enjoys the sun, it's bathed in the sun and it collects that energy and it stores it in the walls. Just like on a hot day you might have a brick wall that gets very very hot so as the sun goes down you can feel all the warmth actually radiating from the wall. All we're doing in this building is, is exploiting that principle and we're doing it by putting a big glass facade over the front of the building to maximise the amount of sunlight that can come in. And that sunlight falls against the back wall and is stored. 
and when the temperature drops on a day like today for example as we're in the middle of winter all the heat comes back out the walls and heats the space for free and the reason that is so significant as simple as an idea as it is is the fact that if you look at the patterns of, of energy consumption in buildings 50 percent or 50 to 60 percent of that is directly space heating so it can be said it's quite a blunt statement but it can be said we are literally consuming all the fossil fuel resources of this planet to actually heat our homes and the big distinction between this building an earthship and a conventional building is the fact that in its day-to-day -day running we are consuming absolutely no fossil fuel for heating this building so before we actually start to think about different other ways that we can cut the energy use in this building and be more energy efficient in the way that we use our power in this building we've instantly removed 50 60 percent of the need for the energy and that's why the whole idea of thermal mass or passive solar design as it's otherwise known is so significant. I mean all, all buildings have dense matter in them, I mean bricks, masonry, that's what a lot of buildings are made from, not all, some, some are made from timber, um, mm -hmm. but all buildings that have dense matter in them, that matter um, is otherwise known as thermal mass, it can be used to store heat and if you treat that in the right way by insulating around it you can then use that building for free heating and cooling and that's exactly what we're doing here. Yeah, we've got two technologies here that we're using directly for generating electricity. I mean, the uses in the building are, are pretty standard that you would have everywhere, for example, sockets in the walls or lighting or computers or fridges. We generate electricity from two sources, from a wind generator which is outside and an array of solar panels that's along the back of the building as well. All of the ideas in this building could easily be incorporated into other buildings. I mean, for example, all of the renewable technologies that we've got, the solar panels, the wind turbine, they could be put onto other buildings. But the absolutely critical thing, and it's kind of the starting point really, before you consider sticking any renewable on a building, the first thing that you need to think about is the actual energy consumption of the building in terms of its fabric. And that's quite a complicated way of saying really, you just need to look at what your building's built from and specifically how well insulated it is but how airtight it is as well, because I mean those are the two critical things, those are the two areas where you're really going to lose lots and lots of energy. And if it works out that you're losing far more energy than you would be from generating electricity from the sun or from the wind, then that's where you should really start to think about sort of, sort of lightening your footprint by insulating your house very well and, and making sure it's airtight. Those are the absolutely critical things. Yeah, we've got a couple of technologies for heating water. The main one is a couple of solar thermal panels that are up on the roof and they're a very simple technology. The sun just hits the panels and it heats the water in the panels and when the water gets to a certain temperature it flows down through to our sort of hot water tank. And this here is the wood pellet stove which just acts as a backup boiler. So I mean just as in most people's houses they have one that runs on gas this just runs on wood pellets, and wood pellets are just junk wood, they're just sawdust, so we're creating heat or hot water in this instance from just basically junk wood sawdust. The water systems in this building are quite different to a conventional building, um, particularly when it comes to the idea of sewage. In a conventional building, what tends to happen is that we take all of the waste water and then we just lump it all in together and then we pipe it up the building in a soil pipe. And it means that we end up with lots and lots of sewage that's very contaminated with lots of human waste, lots of bleach, lots of other chemicals, lots and lots of chicken, sorry, kitchen scraps, lots and lots of different things really, and that sort of add to add up all together to be a really sort of noxious soup that, that's really, really difficult to treat. And then we pump that away to a sewage farm, and then we have to invest a lot of time and energy and effort in actually refining it to something that's ultimately pure water or barely pure water again. The Earthship approach is very, very different in the sense that it's a lot more logical. What it does is it separates out all the different waste waters at different areas and treats them separately. So the waste water that we have from a sink, for example, or a shower, is grey water. And what I mean by that is the fact that it's waste water, but it hasn't been mixed with kind of human waste such as species, species or urine or, or whatnot. And so we have water that's a lot cleaner, and although you really wouldn't want to do that much with it, it's still a very, very valuable resource that, that you can do things with. And so what we have in the Earthship is we have two planters in this particular Earthship. And they, just using very, very kind of natural processes that plants do all the time, they, the water kind of forms a water table underneath and it flows through and the plants just clean the water for us. And then the water sits in a well at the end of that. And then we draw the water through and actually flush the toilet with it. 
And so that's the way that we deal with the grey water. The black water, which is water that is mixed with kind of human waste, is dealt with separately. It flows through to a septic tank, which is outside, which then overflows to a reed bed. And so once again, what we're doing in that instance is just using plants to treat our waste, which is quite a sort of separate idea, really, than using lots and lots of, sort of very energy intensive, chemical intensive kind of methods to treat sewage. Here, what we're trying to do is treat it as holistically as possible by just letting natural processes do what they do anyway. But instead of just letting those natural processes sort of get on and get out of step, what we're trying to do is make a building that's in tune with them so we can take all of these natural ideas and just turn them and use them to our advantage. All the water that we have in the Earthship is harvested from rain. The rain falls down onto the roof and then it flows down the central guttering just in front of us and then it flows to this area here through this bed of gravel and the gravel kind of takes out all the leaves and the twigs and other bits and pieces and then the water just flows through to four tanks which is our storage for all our rainwater just behind. Yeah, the whole purpose of this project really was twofold. Um, the first and probably the most important was to actually build a community centre and so it's a facility that all people in Brighton and Hove, but specifically Stanmore Organics, which is the 17 acre organic farm that, that we're in the midst of, has a facility for, to be used um, for, for whatever environmental education or just as a social space to be used. The second is the fact that it is a show home to demonstrate really what an Earthship is. I mean, it's the only Earthship in England and the Earthship is an approach that's been evolving for the last 35 years out in New Mexico. Um, but this is a kind of English example and there are only two in, in the whole of the UK so it's quite a prominent UK example as well. Yeah, the whole Earthship movement is growing, um, sort of slowly evolving and there are lots of Earthships out in the States, in New Mexico where the idea actually was created by Mike Reynolds and there are lots and lots of Earthships there, hundreds. Um, but there are a fair sort of few scattered sort of around the other kind of corners of the globe and there's a few in Europe, there's one in Belgium, Spain, I think there's one in Sweden as well. And obviously there's two in the UK, one here, and one up in Fife in Scotland. Um, but there, I think there are others in Honduras and various other places really. So slowly as time grows, the whole sort of movement is growing and more and more of them are being built. One, one, one really sort of important aspect of, of the project um, as we sort of close the actual building phase of it is really sort of disseminating and spreading out all the ideas really. I mean, I really have to say I wouldn't expect to see thousands or hundreds um, of Earthships built in, in England in how, the next however many years. Um, but I think lots of the ideas here are very, very simple ideas that could be really easily incorporated um, to lots and lots of new builds and could be slightly, slightly more complicated but could easily be incorporated into existing buildings as well. So that's the, the, the next crucial step is really getting the ideas out there and permeating mm -hmm. them through so they end up um, being incorporated in far more buildings. Are the government not already doing that? Uh, I mean, some of the ideas, they're starting to use in, in new homes? Oh, I forgot that one. They are and they're not. Oh. I mean, building regulations, which is the code that all sort of buildings have to be built to, um, is very uh, lacklustre for want of a better description. I mean this year, I think it was in April this year, we had a real opportunity because the whole part L, which is building regulations are divided up into lots of different letters and I think part L is to do with energy use and efficiency in buildings and we had a real opportunity to really sort of tighten it up and ratchet it up and, and start to design buildings that are incredible in the way that, that they're insulated and they're energy efficient but unfortunately um, the, the build got watered down, watered down and, Yes, it's a step forward, but it was a step when really we need to be taking leaps and bounds. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that the level of insulation that we have um, in this country is below the level that was set in, by Sweden in 1978, which is almost 30 years ago. So, I mean, we really are behind the game, very much behind the game. And from, from what I was saying earlier about the statistics with regards to the amount of energy use and loss in buildings, I mean, it's absolutely critical, absolutely critical. We're losing what well, we are creating 30% of our carbon footprint through misuse of energy in buildings. Mm -hmm. I mean, for sure, we're never going to get away completely from using energy in buildings. Uh, but what we can do, mm -hmm. and what we should be doing, is making as much effort to lower that impact as far as we can.
Yeah, I am a member of the Low Carbon Network. It was a company or community company that was set up about four or five years ago, um, really with the purpose of highlighting the connection between energy use or resource use and buildings and, and climate change uh, through two different routes, really. Um, innovative construction projects, which is what this Earth Ship Brighton project is, and communications work, which is talking about the ideas and disseminating all the ideas to different people, and that was the idea, really. That's why it was set up. Yeah, we offer tours of this building, um, generally on the first and third Sunday of every month, but if you look at our website, you can see and come down and actually see the building for itself. It's sort of one thing, seeing sort of pictures of it and hearing a few words about it, but the real sort of thing about the building is the way that it actually feels when you're inside it. It's very kind of natural sort of building, and yeah, come down and uh, actually see the project and feel it in the flesh. We give tours to lots of different people, including groups of school kids and college kids and university um, students as well. So the idea really is to sort of tell lots and lots of different audiences about the project, particularly sort of the next generation, because obviously they are kind of very, very important in uh, the overall scheme of it.